happy Hanukkah and welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the incredible counselor, Catherine Kevening of the City of Dryden, Ontario. But before we jump into that interview, we would like to ask a favor. Creating content that sheds light on issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you have come to expect from us. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Kevening. Catherine, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to start with this general question, but it's the most important question to start off all my interviews. So you're no exception to that. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Catherine? Excellent, Q. I feel like I have always kind of had this sense of needing to give back. It really did start probably in high school. I was hanging out with a friend who was very involved with OSED, which is the Ontario Students Against Impaired Driving group. And she was volunteering and I was just kind of there hanging out. And one of our adult um, leaders was like, hey, like, why aren't you volunteering for us? Like, you're always here. And I'm like, oh, great question. Um, yeah, I should volunteer. And so I got very heavily involved in, in leadership at my high school and then leadership provincially. I sat on the student advisory committee for OSED provincially, and that was a huge deal because it was just a bunch of young people across the province who got together four times a year and planned a provincial conference for other young people. So that really was the catalyst of my volunteering base. And I guess once I got that feeling of like, wow, I'm doing something that is really, really impactful and does really good, meaningful work for our communities, that's kind of what hit home for me. And that is, that's the thing that I liked most about it. So it's always just kind of been embedded into my personhood volunteering is just kind of a given and I do it all the time even now sitting on council as as a, a young person they say that we have all of this energy and I don't know if I believe that anymore because I'm tired all of the time but it it is really just become a compulsion at this point that I need to give back to my community because I care so deeply about the issues, obviously not every issue, because that would be a bit much, but the issues that are close to my heart are ones that I just cannot in good conscience leave alone. Or if I have to, I will find ways to signal boost those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, that's really, I think where it started. And I've always really been kind of interested in, in the politics side of things. I in oh my gosh what grade was it uh, when I was about 16 I had the opportunity to go um, learn about different advocacy techniques and I was really really involved with our local youth action alliance which was very focused on um, denormalizing the tobacco industry and how they target young people and so again, another very small thing that kind of snowballed in 20, uh, 2008, uh, my friends and I started a, a national campaign to change legislation to get flavors out of tobacco products. And so we were- oh, hold, hold on, hold on a second. You were that people? You were that group? Yeah. I remember doing stories on that- <laughs> I think we might have actually chatted before. 
Really? That's crazy. Small world, because I come from Ontario, and I remember, because I was going through uh, Loyalist College at the time, I remember this story coming across our assignment editor's desk and saying, can you do a story on this? Oh I think God. we've chatted before. <laughs> That's wild. Honestly, anytime it comes up in conversation, people are like, oh, yeah, like, I remember that. And I I'm like... <laughs> I know you from a hole in the wall. Like, it's so crazy how this has really just like connected a lot of people. And it was a big deal. Like it started in Northwestern Ontario, they, these tiny, tiny communities coming together, young people advocating for big changes at the legislation level that they wanted to see. And yeah, so we were constantly on, on Parliament Hill. We worked very closely um, with our MP at the time, Greg Rickford. Uh, we worked with Megan Leslie, who was the uh, MP of Halifax, who had put forth this private member's bill, you know, eons ago, it feels like now. So we're very, very, very involved in those levels. And so that's kind of where my interest in, in the government process began. Um, and so, you know, molding those two things, giving back to the community, getting involved in the political process, that was something that I was like, this, this journey makes sense for me right now. Um, was mom and, and dad I, political? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But like the, the caring adults around me as a young person were very much like, this is, this is the way change happens. Like you have to go to the doors you have to get your people around you and talk about these issues and get them on board so we had you know tens of thousands of, of signatures on a petition um we were thinking of creative ways to advocate and talk about our issues because we didn't want you know to just go and make presentations we wanted to be weird and loud and you know for people to notice us and realize that this is a, a big deal, not just for us, but for, you know, the country, our province, et cetera. So those, and I mean, this is a very long-winded answer, but those are the, the things. It'd be, it'd be really, really crappy if it wasn't. So for a show about <laughs> talking, if you gave a one word answer, it would be really bad. So thank you for being long-winded. Yeah. So, so yeah, those, those are the things. And then in 2018, um, well, a little bit before I was asked by some friends who run the, the chapter of our green parties, I don't know, like their local association. And they were like, hey, would you ever consider running for the green party federally? And at the time I was like, yes, but not right now. And they were like, okay, we'll put a pin in it. And I was like, great. And in 2018, they asked again, they were like, hey, provincially, would you consider being our green candidate? And I was like, yeah, why not? And I did it. And I didn't win, obviously, because 2018 was also the municipal election in okay, Ontario. Okay, hold on two seconds here, because I think I got my information incorrect then. Oh. Federally, you ran in 2018, right? No, not federally. Okay, I, I from what I understand, before. from the, the 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 research I did, what riding did you run in in 2018? So, because I have went, you running in 2022 for the Green Party. Oh yeah, no, you're right. I am. You can cut this. I see. This is how tired I am. In 2018, I ran municipally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Didn't get in. In 2022, I ran provincially and municipally. Yes. There we are. Okay. Okay. So my out. information was correct. I was like, okay. I'm testing you. I just, this is. That's the only thing I know about my guest is their electoral history. That's <laughs> it. So if anything else comes up, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, totally. That sounds great. Um, you know what? But better I, you than me at this point. I'm like, yeah. He's done I want homework. I want this to talk great. about that 2018 election for a second. Oh, okay. Because your description, your backstory leads me to believe that your trajectory was not going to be municipal politics at all. For someone who's advocating on the federal and provincial level, 
it seems like a natural fit would be a provincial run. But in 2018, you decide municipal is where it's at. Municipal is where I'm going to start getting my sort of teeth cut a little bit. What was it about the allure, the draw to municipal politics that finally made Catherine say to herself, now is the time, this is the election, municipals where it's at. What was that moment for you? So I think the big thing was that I wanted to win. And <laughs> I know. And, and obviously, Most honest right? answer for coming from someone ever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but really, like that's that's what it was. I was like, my chances of winning are far higher if I start municipally. Mm -hmm. And so so when I think about the political climate in our region, in our riding, it has very much been uh, historically more NDP, which is surprising. Um, but also very conservative. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. Both of our provincial and federal representatives are conservative. Um, our provincial rep currently used to be our federal representative. So um, when when thinking about these things, I was like, yeah, I, I don't want to do this to not win. Um, obviously, 2018 didn't work out for me because I didn't get elected to council. It was a but you lot. Were of... Close. I was okay. I didn't do awful. I think I got. I don't know, like votes. around 900 something votes. Yeah. So in the I second was like... place was like 1,100. So you were about 200 votes for your first time out. That is a big win, no matter who you are. Thanks. And I mean, I felt really good about it. I was like, you know what? I'm not from this community. I am very much involved in the community and lots of people know me and understand, you know, what I'm about for the most part. Um, so I, as much as I was disappointed, I was like, you know what? This is, this is fine. And maybe again in four years, I will have a better go of it. And that's, and really like, that's the long-term plan. And it was actually a really good thing that I didn't get elected because two months later I found out I had breast cancer and I was like oh man so I had to like that was a whole other thing that I wasn't like uh yeah I really don't want to do this super publicly so <laughs> so I was like you know what weird flex universe but okay like let's let's do this so that's that's where that kind of came from and I when when I saw you know, the, the roster for upcoming candidates in 2022 after running provincially, which was a whirlwind. And I don't know, don't know if I would do it again. It's a, it's a bit prohibitive in a lot of the um, protocol and processes and procedures. And I'm like, Ooh, this was not the experience that I wanted it to be. Um, Whereas running municipally, like you're just kind of, they're just like, here, just do it. And yeah. you have so much more control over things, which is great. Um, but it is still a lot of work. Um, and I think I would have done even better had I, um, had I organized a bit more of the, you know, volunteer base and had people going door knocking for me and, you know, was really committed to fundraising. But Again, as someone who was working full time, that wasn't as realistic for me personally. But again, some people are like, you know what, this is, this is where I'm putting all of my eggs and, and that's what's going to work for me. And for me, I was like, you know what, I want to do this while still maintaining a little bit of sanity. Can I ask you a very political question in this part about you and not about the politics, but I'm going to ask the political question here. Mm -hmm. You run for the Green Party of Ontario in 2022. You decide a few months later that you're going to put your name forward for municipal office in the city of Dryden. Now, I am under the understanding, and this is just me saying this, this is not the councillor talking, this is me saying this, that the people of Canada do not 
truly understand the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities that come with each level of the uh, of of government. They will talk to anyone who comes no door knocking in a political sense and ask them a range of issues. Now, for someone who ran both provincially and municipally in one year, how often were you hearing provincial I issues talked about at the municipal election and municipal and federal issues talked about at the provincial uh, election? And when you did hear that, did you have to just listen or was there a moment when you had to say, I just have to explain to them that this is not the election that they want to be talking about that in? Or did you want to sort of have that conversation? Because as their potential next next represent, representative, you will have to address a range of issues. Excellent cue. So <laughs> it happened. it happened so frequently and... I don't even remember how I found it. It might have been someone sharing it or um it, it just coming up on some of the more political pages I follow. But I I had to share a couple times, I think, or I told lots of people about it. But that damn video, that the little song, the Who Does What? Do you remember this? Who does what? I really want to know this that's the one and I was like you know what this it laid it out nicely for me like folks this is what we need to talk about because absolutely lots of people even even at our municipal candidate debates some of the prospective candidates were talking about things like health care and education and I'm like that is not that's not our job like we can absolutely do our best to support things and amplify, signal boost, whatever, but they are not a, a municipality's mandate. Um, and that that was a really big reason why I ran too in 2022, because I was like, no one really, I think, understands the delicate differences between each level of government. And I I ran on a platform of like transparency, accountability, like these, these big, big things. And also I'm just like, people typically don't understand what exactly their municipalities are doing. But as soon as a municipality stops doing the things they're supposed to do, that's when they're like, whoa, 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 what? you changed our garbage schedule? I didn't know. And it's just like, okay, well, we sent out multiple flyers and if you're just throwing away your flyers and your recycling bin then obviously you're not going to see it we don't have a local newspaper anymore and that was you know a huge way for a lot of people to get information and now we're relying hugely on Facebook on our websites like on you know me posting to Facebook being like, hey everybody like just so you know this is what council is talking about these are things we're looking at or hey I got to you know, play dress up with the fire department and cut open a car, like, cool. So the this average person piece... doesn't listen to that stuff, though. And that's, I, I'm not trying to burst your bubble here, Catherine, but the as a former communications officer for a community, for a municipality, I can tell you, you can communicate till you're blue in the face in social media. You can go uh, put flyers in everyone's mailbox. There's always going to be that one person who says, I didn't get it. So yeah. how do you see your role in bridging that gap, because I can imagine you want everyone to be informed as much as possible, but you only can do 90% of the work. The other 10% has to come from the community. And I'm not trying to put labels here because I think it's truly the way that it works. How do you see trying to get those residents to go that 10% of the way to in get engaged and get informed? I mean, I think of that excellent Leslie Nope quote where they're they're at like that that in like the first season they're having the public meeting and she's like what I hear when people are yelling at me is that they're caring really loudly and I'm like yes so typically when we do things that people are mad about they respond and as much as I'm like oh no another mean email <laughs> I'm also like, 
yes, look at you taking responsibility, you know, exercising your civic duty to figure out more stuff. And in my brain, as I'm trying to be like, don't be mean, don't be mean, don't be mean. I'm also like, oh, I'm so grateful for people like this, because these are the people that like, if you can get them to, you know, calm down a little bit to be more receptive. And I think that is a a very good gift that I have. Usually if people are yelling at me, I'm like, oh no. Um, But I'm also kind of like, okay, like I hear you. And also here's, here's a, a delicate way for me to either tell them, oh, what you're, what you're saying is wrong, or you are a little bit confused on this thing, or here is the rationale for X, Y, or Z. Like, I don't ever want to hold anything back from anyone, but also there are certain things that I am bound to hold confidential. And that's just that. So we've had a few different things where people were like, oh, council is hiding this from us, or you know, um, they're not There's in camera sessions that you can't disclose on regular. <laughs> yes. And when you, when people see that in camera thing, I, I, I often heard on social media when I was working for the community that I worked in, Oh, what are you hiding now? What what's hiding? And I'm like, not, it's literally, there's three reasons, land, legal, and personnel are the only reasons why there'd be a in camera <laughs> session, but Right. And I think, too, even calling it in camera, people are like, what the heck does that mean? And I'm like, it literally is just a weird way for us to say confidential. Yeah. And part of me is like, so I don't, again, I'm going to tangent because this is just the way that my brain works. Um, have you ever read the book Teardown? No, I can't say I have. Okay. So I read it at the beginning of this year, and it was probably the best book that I've read this year that was nonfiction. It's by Dave Meslin. Dave Meslin, who is just a delight. Um, I think he is really, really creative and he is so committed to securing equitable equitable democracy for all of us. I am just like in awe. So this book is essentially about how do we rebuild democracy by tearing down the things that are just not working for us? And so one of the big things that I have had a couple conversations with our communications person about is user experience, right? Like the way that we communicate online with people, the way that our meetings are designed are not conducive to the democratic process. Lots of municipalities have rules in place that if the public shows up to their uh, meetings, all they can do is watch. They cannot participate. And so Meslin's whole thing is participatory democracy and how important it is to have everyone engaged in this process. And that is one thing that I'm like, like it makes me sweat because I'm so excited about it. But these are the things that I would like to see happen that could help bridge the gap between the folks that have no idea what's going on in the city until something happens where they're like, I hate this versus, you know, coming to city council meetings and being like, oh, damn, something cool is actually on the table that they're discussing or something important like our budget. Our budget is extremely important our budget is extremely complicated and even though I've been in the role for just over a year now there are very many moments where I you know come into the meeting and I'm like I think I understand what we're talking about today and hence why I don't know if you've ever watched any of our council meetings and I don't blame you if you haven't but I oh I have Oh, I have. Oh, <laughs> hooray. Um, so you might have noticed that I ask so many questions and I feel I feel obligated to, right, on the behalf of my constituents to be like, yeah, am I understanding this correctly? Does this make sense? 
why are we doing things like this? Have we consulted the right people? All of these, these big questions, um, because that's going to hopefully, one, reflect well on myself to be like, wow, she's doing her job, bare minimum, two thumbs up, gold star, great. Um, but also, like, I just, I want one to know for myself and two, so that I can relay this back to people, you know, the small group of people who do follow my page, who do frequently engage with me on social media. So I do my very best to, um, to respond to people in the most kind, courteous way that I can. I get letters from like little kids and I respond to everyone because Mm -hmm. I'm like, here, this is such an important thing for them to see that an elected official is one listening to them, you know, validating, you know, whatever concerns or ideas that they have. And I think that representation is so, so important. So that's another big reason why I ran. I was like, there is no one under 35. There are no queer people. Like there's only one woman on council. So bringing, you know, all of these lived experiences of my own to this table, I was like, this is really important. And I wish, I wish I had more young people. I wish we had, you know, indigenous people on our council. I mean, there's only so many seats you can fill, but I'm also like representation is really, really important to me in a nutshell. You seem like a very personable person. It seems like you'd like to engage with people, but I can imagine and I, I've imag- I can imagine I can only imagine just because I've chatted with municipal leaders from across Canada that the sunshine and roses that people think that municipal politics is is not always the case. There is some dark sides to it. There are some negative comments that you get probably on a regular basis that you have to deal with, not only as an individual but as a counselor. You talk about talking to people you talk about communicating with people communication comes with respect and i believe that if as an elected official you have to give the respect to the person who is talking to you the time and your energy to listen to them but you have to do it in a respectful way and on vice versa they have to do it in a, a respectful way as pot as well how do you see yourself listening to everyone in the city of dryden not just the people who agree with you, not just the ones who support you, but the ones who disagree with you vehemently, the ones who think to you, say to you, you you voted the wrong way, you shouldn't have voted this way, and I need to tell you why. Is it hard in a particularly rural city, and I say that respectfully because you are in a rural area, to listen to everyone, even the ones that don't agree with you? For me, yeah. it is not hard. I have a, <laughs> I have some experience with people, you know, disagreeing with the things that I do in the community. Um, to to make a long story short, um, so I I am I'm a queer person. I am in a relationship with someone who was assigned female at birth and um, they are non-binary so <laughs> in a small community we face a lot of backlash that you know is uh is propped up by transphobia homophobia biphobia all of that stuff so <laughs> we had the police called on one of our events last year And I had a police officer show up to my place of work, pull me out of a meeting and essentially interrogate me about our event. And it was a very intense conversation because on on our side, I was like, we have done nothing wrong. We are 
you know, Dryden is wanting very much to be a safe and accepting community for everyone. And this, you know, our, our pride group, our organization is committed to making sure that queer people in our communities feel safe, feel celebrated and feel supported. So we had someone who was actually not from our community, you know, try to jeopardize our events, try to jeopardize our partnerships with our venues and, and strong partners in our community to make us look bad. Um, they, you know, accused our performers of being pedophiles and accused my partner of being one as well. And as difficult as that entire weekend and, you know, the aftermath of everything was, I am, I am propped up by my community. And at the end of the day, I do my best to not take anything personally and I do my best to listen authentically to people and to, I guess, to, to more or less come alongside people and say, you may not agree with X, Y, or Z, and I may not agree with what you're doing on your own. But there is, because of the position that I hold, I understand that when I am fighting for access to whatever or the ability to, you know, freely be out in your community, I very much believe that, you know, I want to protect everyone's right and especially the folks who are most vulnerable in our communities and that is where that is where I guess my compassion for people who are caring loudly at me comes from because I know that for the most part it's not personal they they see me usually as a safe person to have those conversations with because I mean I'm I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to name call people. I might, you know, initially start off very defensive, but having conversations with people, having dialogue, I think is really, really important. It makes me, you know, better at this job. It makes me a more compassionate human. It makes me more patient. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I want to have like, difficult conversations are kind of fun you know like I I read yes, a paper they are. <laughs> right right and I, I read this great paper that um, its main thesis was essentially like conflict isn't bad conflict leads to growth and I was like Phew. I was like yes like when you when you look historically right like all of the conflict around the world or conflict between people who are willing to put in the work to work through it actually like have stronger connections. And that is something that I wholeheartedly believe in because I want people to feel like they can bring those difficult things to me without me being like, you're being, you know, too emotional about this. I, I can't have a conversation with you, you know, X, Y, or Z. That's, that's not my jam. I'm like, let's have that difficult conversation. I'm going to, I'm going to probably react emotionally. I'm going to have all these things, but it's not going to diminish, you know, my personhood. It's not going to diminish the things that I have to say in response. But again, like, as you said, it comes down to respect and everyone deserves that. I deserve it. They deserve it. Even if they're, you know, uh, complaining about whatever they're complaining about as long as it isn't you know blatant hate speech I'm like bring it on because with that I'm like okay zero tolerance policy if you're going to be you know homophobic or islamophobic or whatever I'll I'm like mm -mm -mm. like this is not the conversation that I'm going to have with you and I set out my boundaries and I have to hold myself to them 
and that can be difficult. Um, but that's that's kind of part of the game. Catherine, we are 40 minutes into this interview already, and I feel like we could talk for another 40 minutes just on yourself. But I am cautious of time, and I want to talk about okay. uh, a subject that uh, goes into a little bit more of the uh, role of a counselor. And I want to preface this question by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. She is one vote at counsel, and she they only get one vote. So in your opinion, as of recording this episode at the end of 2023, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Dryden today? It is going to be difficult quantifying this because I feel like there are a few things that I could talk about. I think what I hear from a lot of constituents is the um, the prioritization, I guess, of our infrastructure. So historically, you probably... Or like, hmm, it's going to be one I, out of I, ten. I, I, no, no, I'm not saying that I was in Dryden <laughs> earlier in August and I asked uh, about 20 people uh, what their issues were <laughs> while I was sitting at Tim Hortons eating some uh, a nice big uh, sandwich. I'm not going to say ham sandwich because my Jewish husband would slap me right now. So I'm not going to say that at all. But I'm going to say I did have conversations and shockingly, infrastructure was the top one that kept on coming up, counselor. <laughs> hmm. That is so validating. Um, and and I hear I hear everybody because it is. It is shocking. The, um, oh gosh, what's the word? N not deficit, but the the amount of infrastructure needs that our community has is shocking. It is overwhelming. It is gargantuan. Um, someone at last night's council meeting, I think it might have been our mayor actually was like oh yeah I was talking with someone and um under under some of our roads we have like water and sewer lines that are over a hundred years old and I was like ah <laughs> and and so when we're having conversations at the council table and we're like okay what are our priorities like we have uh ancient literally ancient infrastructure and we have very very little um budget to accommodate the massive upgrades that are needed unfortunately in our community so infrastructure i mean obviously 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 i wish that i wish that we had the 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 reserves that we could apply for bigger pots of money to access, you know, uh, more work to be done. It is also very, very difficult for us to like get contractors because they are so busy in our area. It is hard to secure people who can prioritize our jobs. And so that compiled with everything just makes it so much more difficult. Um, now, can I ask a, a natural follow-up question to the infrastructure question? And yeah. I apologize to throw this in the left field. I just, I think it's an important question. You're right. Municipalities cannot run deficits. So therefore they have a very small pool of money, but you have to grow the community as best as you can every year. And as I, as you were uh, talking about earlier, and I think even think in our pre-interview, um, you're going through budget right now. And that means that you have to make some very tough decisions, <laughs> very tough decisions. Mm -hmm. And I got to ask, how do you balance the macro issues with the individual micro issues that people have, that people want 
fixed in their community because you have to make the tough decision. You have to say, okay, Jim's pothole, Jim's area sidewalk that he needs done is not going to get done. Sandra's uh, area where she needs a new park isn't going to get done because we have to worry about this 1923 pipe that is still underground being used. And that's going to cost a lot more money. Is it challenging to balance the needs of the community with the individual? Yes. Yes. <laughs> simple yes, yes, question, yes. simple answer. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, this, and I mean, this is, this comes up every single year, right? Like lots of the, the projects that we have that go onto our capital budget is like sheets and sheets and sheets of these, these little jobs. I say little because they're written very, very smallly so that you can fit a whole bunch of them onto one Excel sheet. Um, but you know, you're, you're like, okay, well, a lot of these, these uh, assets that we have have to be replaced and we are not immune, sadly, to inflation. Everything that we purchase, everything that we rent or lease, every contracting job that comes through RFP, um, these have gotten exponentially larger. <laughs> Uh, as as I move through, you know, my years on council, and it is so gutting to look at the budget that we have and see all of the money that we actually have no control over. And I think um, talking about that specifically citizens is probably the best way to be like hey listen this is why we can't do the things that we know we have to do because we have and I had a great conversation with one of my besties about this and she was like think about your budget as like you get 100 pennies and 46 of those pennies will go to the solicitor general so that we can pay for policing costs and another uh, 30 pennies will go to, you know, maintaining other like city services. And then 12 pennies will go to our social services, things like that. And like, and then you have like 11 pennies left and that's what you get to, that's the money you have control over. And when I think about it like that, cause I'm like, yeah, explain the budget to me. Like I'm five because I'm not, I'm not a, a, a good numbersy person like that feels very challenging to me but I'm working on it I'm doing my best but when you when you really break it down to its most simple components to be like yeah we only get control over this tiny tiny bit of our budget and then you look at this excel sheet that has like 40 different line items that are like okay well this you know new fire truck costs 2.5 million dollars and you look at your 11 pennies and you're like, uh, nope. And so you go down the line again and you're like, okay, what do we got? Solar panels? Maybe, maybe, maybe if we can make it work. And it is a, it is alarming if, you know, anyone were to look at our budget to see how much we rely on provincial and federal grants. It is incredible. And I commend our city staff so so much for doing the work that essentially keeps the lights on in our town because they are the ones who while we make the hard decisions they're the ones executing the hard work and I am eternally grateful for our hard-shelled exterior staff who you know go into work every day and they're just kind of like yep I know what I got to do. And, you know, I have the support of council to do these things. So that's the tangent off of infrastructure. <laughs> really, that's where. 
So yeah. I want to flip the question because I don't want to just talk about the negative issues because I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negatives when it comes to communities. So I'm trying to change that. Look at me. I'm growing as a host. Um, I want to ask, what do you think the city of Dryden gets right? What is the thing that you look at the city and you go, you know what? Other communities are doing okay. We're doing it better. What do you boast about when it comes to the city of Dryden when you talk to municipal leaders from across Ontario or even across Canada? Oh, good one. I feel like what we do really well is, you know, utilize what very few uh, resources we have. Like we make it work. Um, I recently got to experience teeny tiny portion of what it's like to be a firefighter at our local fire hall um and i think that our fire service is doing really really well we have a large complement so we have two fire halls that um are actually doing quite well uh recruitment wise we now have multiple women who show up to our fire wow. service yeah right like that's that's something that hadn't been really happening before um maybe three four years ago so like that's that's a new thing they're working very much on recruiting women to our fire service which i'm like heck yes um and a few of them are my friends and i'm just like oh i wish i could do what you do but i'm so tired and I can't I can't do any more things I'm already doing so many things um but it is it after that evening I was like wow this is really fun as someone who is very much a sensation seeker I feel like I would thrive in this environment and please send me into a burning building um but they were like we actually don't do so much of that and I was like oh well um but I I think that they are you know really getting the most out of their training opportunities we have like class act people who are our volunteers so there are some full-time paid firefighters but the majority of our model locally is volunteer run and it's working very very well for us um because of budget constraints obviously there are some barriers to you know exceeding expectations but at this point, they're doing really well with what they have and and we're doing our best to support them through that. So I think that's definitely one of the things. Um, what else are we doing really well? well? I mean, again, cautious of time here and I don't want I don't want it to keep you longer than I, I need to. But if you have another one, great. But I want to talk about my last subject and oh, it's sure. my favorite subject to talk about. Because I think, and I truly believe this, that municipalities have untapped resources when it comes to tourism in our country. I do not think that municipalities do a good enough job promoting their own backyard when we talk about tourism. And it's an economic driver that a lot of people just often don't look at. As I've said, I was just recently in uh, Dryden it, earlier in August. I will be back in August of 2024, I will be making sure I stop in with my husband in tow and probably all of our dogs. So hopefully there's a dog park. Um, what yes. are some of the, because I'm actually going to stay there longer than just a sandwich at Tim Hortons and asking random people questions with my Alberta license plate. What are some of the hidden gems that you tell people to go see when they're in the city of Dryden? Okay, so this is uh, probably also my favorite question. So hidden gems in Dryden. And I can't believe you're making me spill all of the tea because we, a big part. Please tell me it's the big moose. Please tell me it's the big <laughs> moose because I stopped and I was like, I need a photo of this moose. And then everyone was looking at me going, why is this random person taking a photo with our moose? But okay. People do it constantly you you are not special <laughs> everyone loves max okay okay 
No, I'm just I'm obviously kidding. You're very special and and I appreciate you. But Max is Max is like so hot. Everyone is like, you have a giant moose? And we're like, yes. Um, we also have this eagle bench. Um, we we have a we have a lot going for us. <laughs> which is great. Um, our, our biggest thing that people are typically really excited about is, is the fact that we are a, a, a hidden gem essentially. And they're like, we don't like to tell people about it because, because then more people will come here and ruin it. Who knows? Right. But they're like, no, the best part about being in our community is that we're not that far from a major city. You know, we've got, um, we've got all of this natural beauty around us. We can, you know, go jump in the goon whenever we are feeling called to. Um, and, and the majority of, of our love for our community comes from its natural resources. So if anyone is flying or driving through Dryden, I am always like, okay, how much time do you have? Um, how able-bodied are you feeling? Because some of my favorite things uh, about Dryden are our hiking trails. I absolutely love them. I think they are incredibly beautiful. And I, I've been here for 10 years. It took me a really long time to get into like the Ghost and Mavis Lake trails. But they are some of the most interesting and beautiful trails I think I've ever been on. And that is because of the, the work of the volunteers of the Dryden Ghost Riders. They are um, like a, a local, uh, not BMX, but they're like the, they're biking. Like they use the trails for biking as well. So they're not just foot trails. You'll have lots of people on like fat bikes going through and um, they're and like all year long, like even in the winter, you've got people on bikes pedaling through and they're intense. We have, um, we have a trail called Boneyard and to its namesake, there are bones littered across this trail. And some of them are set up like ornaments in a tree. Some are like nailed to trees and it's just like a big deer face or like a moose face. I'll, I can send you pictures because no, they're no, no, I appreciate you saying animal bones because all I was <laughs> thinking at that time was um okay Sorry. because you're like ghost riders i'm like like okay <laughs> oh no okay and so also why we are a hidden gem is because this is where the bodies are chris like come on of course <laughs> obviously we can't be spilling our secrets that way oh so you talk about the trails but i'm gonna sort of uh, I'm going to sort of play Sophie's choice with you here for a second. Oh, no. Okay. What's that one place that you go to in t in the city that you can let it all go away after a long day of council meetings, after a stressful day at work, where's that escape for you? Is there a place that you can just go recenter yourself knowing that tomorrow you're going to be back at it, making tough decisions potentially being uh, talked to, uh, asked questions of, and being expected to know the answers. Where's that safe space for you in the community? Good one. So the first one I can't tell you much about because I have nicknamed it Secret Trail. And it's because like four people know about it. So I'm not- We call that in-camera trail now? Yeah, in-camera trail. <laughs> no one can know about her. Um, but she is one of my favorite, favorite places. Um, the, the community members who know about it have put up adorable little signs and Christmas ornaments along the trail. It's super cute and I love it. And I have told very few people about it. And I have only brought two people there in my 10 years in Dryden because I knew that they needed it. And I was like, secret trail is not a public, like people don't know about this. And I'm not like, you are sworn to secrecy. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, and then the other is in summertime or whenever swimming is okay. Um, my partner and I love going to Flat Rock. 
and and just like walking the little trail along the beach there. Um, we actually, because of climate change, <laughs> we went swimming on October 2nd. Uh, yeah, it was beautiful. It was wow. a beautiful, actually, it was a beautiful day the day before, but we couldn't get out. But I was like, we had both had a weird day. And on October 2nd, we were like, you know what? It's warm. It's really windy, but we should go swimming. Like we should just go jump in the lake. And they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so on October 2nd of this year, we jumped, like we did like a little cold dip in, oh God, was it? eagle lake i don't even know what lake is at flat rock it might be eagle lake or wabagoon i can't even tell anymore everyone who's watching this from dryden is yelling at the screen right now saying why don't you know that name (laughs) and i'm just like i know it's been a long week it's only tuesday (laughs) for those who are watching this this is not airing on a tuesday but yes we're recording it on a tuesday sorry right now in this moment tuesday i think right oh Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> okay. But yeah, okay. so those those are my my two places. Like it's just like, you know, you like water is a good yeah. safe space for me. Um, I'm an Aquarius. I know it's an air sign, but I feel way more connected to water than I do to like wind and whatnot. So that's those are my safe places. If I can go anywhere and be in water, I'm like, oh yeah, this is good. Or on secret trail where like not a, like I very rarely see people on it and I can just go and sit and be like mm, that's a deer over there and I just oh it like nature is very recharging for myself and this is the perfect place to do it like Dryden is like we refer to ourselves as sunset country right like this is where it's yeah. at where northwestern Ontario is filled with so many beautiful things and Dryden, you know, has its yeah you know, weird things, but also it has so much natural beauty to offer and just naturalness. And we do our very best to like work it into everything. We are working with a group that's bringing an outdoor venue to our community. And again, like they're very much taking into account the, the, um, influence of indigenous culture in this venue as well as trying to make it you know a nice kind of big green space but also a space that can be utilized for outdoor concerts or plays or just gathering right just a community space that's outside along the water like this these are the things that are making our community what it is So I have one last question for you, and it's the million dollar question on this show, because I I truly believe that every municipal leader knows how to answer this question, but I'd like to finally put it on the record for everyone to hear about. And for 20 years from now, when people look back on these interviews, go, okay, I get a sense of what the sort of what Dryden was about in 2023. So in your opinion, what makes the city of Dryden, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Okay. Here, here's, here's what it is. Dryden is so incredibly tight knit. Um, So much so that when I first moved here, I was so depressed because I wasn't able to meet people because everyone was very much like, Oh, um, I have, I have my group of friends. This is what we do. Um, and it was really in the beginning, it was very, very difficult to break into a friend group because everyone was like, they were, they were just like, we're so close now there has been a bit of a shift and I think that it's good. So once I broke into a friend group and met people who were living here, working here, typically from here, um, I met some of the most important people in my life. 
And I absolutely feel like small communities like Dryden, like wherever for, for anyone else, but for me, I really feel that Dryden made me the person that I wanted to be. It gave me so many opportunities to do things that I wanted to do, to make connections with really interesting and cool people. Um, I just, and, and again, not everyone is like me. I totally get that. Um, but when I moved here, I, I tried really hard and very intentionally to throw myself face first into this community, like not even feet testing the waters. I was like, okay, like if I'm, if I'm going to be here long-term, I need to weasel my way into everything. And so I volunteered a lot. I met a bunch of people and was brutally honest that I was like, I have no friends. We, can we be friends? <laughs> can we hang out maybe? <laughs> and then some people were like, uh, weird, but okay. Um, and some people were like, you know what? No new friends. I'm, I'm full. And it was like, okay, respect. Like we'll circle back. Like once you know, um, that I'm committed. Right. And I, and I feel <laughs> very, very grateful that the people who were like, yeah, sure, come on down, were, were so open. And I was like, I want to, I want to make sure that I'm that person for anyone else who comes here. Uh, so, you know, the first few years that I lived here, I volunteered my face off. I, you know, volunteered at the cat shelter. I, with some of my new friends, we started the Young Professionals Network. And essentially, like, it wasn't about you know, being a young person working, it was more about like, hey, it's really hard to make friends here. And we know this. And three, two thirds of the folks who started this group were not from Dryden. And so we were like, yeah, it's, it's hard to make friends. Like let's, the primary goal is a social club is to have people meet other people. And we just hang out and talk about things. And sometimes it's work-related. Sometimes we're volunteering and giving back to the community. And these are the things that make me feel really, really great about living here. Like, there are obviously things that are going to suck. And that's just, you know, like, it's not, it's not a Dryden thing. Things can suck anywhere. Thank the lord you know <laughs> so i i just think that here right like once um once that shift happened and people were you know becoming more accepting it really like this community holds on to you very very tightly and supports its own and i think that that is so beautiful so commendable right like this is it's, it's a big part of living in a small town. Everyone knows each other. Everybody knows your business. Um, you know, and they'll kind of come up to you and be like, Hey, you know, how's so-and-so or, Hey, I heard this thing about so-and-so you should reach out. Right. And we're all just like wanting to, for the most part, to care about each other and to be like, yeah, this you're you're one of us and we're going to you know, make sure that you have the same opportunities, that you're having a good time, that things aren't difficult for you while you're here. So I think, I think those are the big, big reasons. I mean, I, I don't mind living in a small town. I've lived in a big city and it, it was okay. Um, but I feel like as someone who is very much committed to making a difference and motivation is absolutely seeing the difference being made. I was like, I can do more in a smaller community than I could in any big city. And I was like, I'm okay with this. Catherine, I want to take a moment and actually thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
Um, I never know how these interviews are going to go. And I always uh, put my foot, best foot forward. And I learn so much from the guests that I have on. But today's interview was probably, bar none, one of my most lighthearted, down-to-earth conversations with a counselor from across Canada that I've had in a very long time. I truly believe, after only chatting with you for an hour, that you have the best interest of your community. You are a true ambassador for your community, and you believe in the best of your community. Um, I truly 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 thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this today this has been overwhelming um i before we got on i should i should sort of tell a uh, side sort of story here for everyone who's listening this this interview has been try has been trying to get onto the books for about a month and a half almost two months now uh my schedule wow. and the counselor's schedules just didn't work out then social media played a role in not connecting but i am so happy so honored that you took time out of your busy 2023 december and Mar november and did this interview with me so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get like emotional. But I, 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 I am so grateful. Like, I am grateful to the community that was like, we're gonna trust this, you know, semi unknown weirdo who is, you know, very, very passionate about the things that she's passionate about. And then is just kind of like, meh, it's okay for things that she's not. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I, I am always you know throwing up being like uh there are a lot of hard parts of this job but I'm at the end of the day I think you know sometimes I feel like I'm nailing it and other times I'm like oh I was a big dummy and 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 that's that's real like I <laughs> I wish that I could be a little bit more inauthentic from from my my work in public health with young people that is that is not an effective way to engage with people and if I want to do this job well it's just like be yourself fight the good fight like again the good fight is subjective <laughs> but you know I feel like I have my priorities straight and you know, that's funnily the only thing that's straight about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> only thing straight about this interview is the, the straight line straight. between the two of us in the video right now. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like Count. this. And I'm just, I'm funny. I am quirky and cool. Like there, there's really no stopping me at this point. And I think people sometimes appreciate that, sometimes not. But I, I also am very appreciative that you were so flexible and so adaptable to me accidentally leaving the country for a week and then coming back and then being like, oh, actually- I found myself outside of Canada. You accidentally- doodle. I had eight days to figure out <laughs> if I was going to leave the country. And I was like, can I do this? Can I just, can I just go? And- and somehow the stars aligned and they were like, pack your bags. Like you, you gotta go. And I was like, oh no. And, and, but I, and I did it. And I, we, I was in a different country for four days out of the eight days that I was away. And I was like, ew, I never want to do that again. Too <laughs> fast, too fast. But now I have, you know, another reason to go back to Finland, which I'm gonna because it was beautiful but but yeah this was eh, listeners this was a, a journey from start to finish for sure I'm pretty sure we got off the Queen Elizabeth there for a few days <laughs> um counselor thank mm -hmm. you so much thank you thank you so much for having me this was a delight Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. 
Now, as we ramp up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with our latest conversations, but you're playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please visit our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in Canada. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.